It says we're live. Action. It says we're live, huh? Hope it's telling the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to the Hunting Public Podcast brought to you by Legendary Whitetails, everyone. This is our first live podcast um, with Legendary. Yeah. And we're actually bringing you this one on the Legendary Whitetails Facebook page. Mm-hmm. Which is pretty cool. Yeah. And it's Brody's birthday. Yeah. Today's... Happy birthday, Brody. <laughs> Thank you. Brody, Brody's a quiet character, you know, and we made it through three quarters of the day without knowing that it was his birthday. So How did you find out? Fun. Facebook? I don't know. A buddy texted me and said, what's Brody doing for his birthday? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Filming a shit. Yeah, right. That's it. <laughs> not getting better not than that. Brody. Yeah. Brody's back there uh, moderating. Um, along with Mindy and Nathan behind the uh, camera right now. So we got lots of help tonight. But before we dive into the meat of the podcast, Legendary is doing a pretty cool giveaway Mm -hmm. tonight during the podcast. So the way this is going to work is as we go and we're talking about stuff and buck bedding and, you know, whatever else, shed hunting that we're going to get into, we want all of you to comment because we'll get to a lot of those within the podcast itself. Mm-hmm. And whoever asks the best questions is going to get entered in to win the legendary giveaway yep. that they got going on tonight. I think they're giving away like 10 of these hoodies. Sweet. You know, these, I think they've got a bunch of different colors and stuff, mm-hmm. but we wear these all the time, you know. And uh, they're going to give away 10 of them at the end of the podcast. So for everybody that's listening or just tuning in, please comment and ask us questions throughout. They're going to pick the best questions. And then uh, AJ at Legendary is going to send me the winners at the end of the show. Even so. even though that they're you know taking the best question, there's no bad question. We like questions, no. so feel free to ask whatever you're, whatever you're thinking. Yeah, feel really. free to ask how old Brody really is. <laughs> <laughs> how old are you? Twenty three. Yep. Nice. Twenty three. The corn dog. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Sweet. Uh, before we get into more of the topics. I want to discuss, for those of you that don't know who we are, we're the hunting public, and we primarily run a YouTube page, Facebook platform, and Instagram. Uh, We create videos that are centered around relating to the normal hunters. Yep. Which is what we are. Right. You know, I mean, we, we own a lot of public land. We hunt small properties on permission, have our entire life, and we pull up. The, we just pull up the YouTube page here, where most of our comment or content airs mm-hmm. throughout the fall and in the spring. We do you know deer hunting, turkey hunting. In the spring we do turkey hunting, not deer hunting and turkey hunting. Well, yeah, that's yeah. true. So but uh, I guess I, I, <laughs> yeah. guess I was referring to in the to fall the, we do deer hunting, in the spring we do turkey. In hunting. In the winter we do scouting, yeah. shed hunting, in predator summer, calling, yeah. rabbit shooting. We're just always yeah. outside doing something outdoors yeah here you can see we've got pulled up this is our youtube page this is going back to september when zach started hunting in nebraska Mm -hmm. and then it goes all the way through our season through the rut into the late season and then the most recent videos are our scouting efforts and podcasts yep and shed hunting too. and and shed hunting we've got about i think there's 77 uh, 78 videos so far so if you haven't caught up there's a lot of oh yeah yes lot please to go, back go and there watch. and subscribe because yeah, we yep. have content going up on this thing all year long yep for for all kinds of uh, you know themes within the outdoor lifestyle really yeah. and if you subscribe every time we post a new video you'll get a notification and you can check it out then that way you don't have to binge watch if you haven't caught up at this point yep so tonight. The first thing we're going to talk about is buck bedding, which if you're not familiar with us, it's something that we drill in to all the time. Our good friend Dan Infault uh, kind of came up with this whole idea several years ago, and uh, we've really kind of clung to it just in the last three seasons, two or three seasons on public land, and found you know that we've got some pretty great results yeah, out of it. Our success has increased significantly since we've started targeting buck bedding specifically we've always hunted bedding areas but now that we're trying to find buck bedding areas we feel as a group that you know our mature buck sightings have just gone up tremendously yeah and as we go remember to comment brody's back there he's reading through stuff right now (laughs) and they're writing stuff down so if you have any questions as we're discussing this there's no bad question no bad question somebody asked did i win 
<laughs> not yet. Not yet. You got to stay here for the rest of the podcast to find out. But uh, buck betting. We're going to use an example mm-hmm. that we had from a hunt last fall. Today, we were actually out shed hunting and scouting, and uh, we actually did an Instagram takeover on the Legendary Whitetails Instagram page where, uh, yeah, we, we found, uh, Zach found, I didn't find, <laughs> Zach found a decent, decent four points, nice yeah, real solid four point side. Oh, uh, we even got the slow motion uh, strut walking nice. down the road. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, Brody and I were kind of just going through a bedding area, you know, where we suspected bucks to be, finding tines of beds. Right about the time we said, hey, this is where a buck would be, I was actually on the phone with Aaron, and he was telling me we had to leave. And I looked down, and I found that shed. So that was pretty cool. But I was like, get off the phone with me. Just keep <laughs> looking. Like, we're not, we're not going anywhere if you're finding antlers. But anyway, the, the antler that he found was one that looked very familiar to us. Mm-hmm. We were actually hunting a buck bedding area in the marsh mm-hmm. where you found that. And this is a pretty good-sized public area. You know, it's it's mostly made up of marsh, flat, river bottom terrain, mm-hmm. which uh, a lot of folks up in Wisconsin are dealing with. I mean, really all over the the Midwest and out east, you're dealing with marshy terrain. Mm-hmm. Um, on on public areas, more specifically, yeah. even. But last fall, we had a very close encounter with a buck that I should have shot, and didn't. <laughs> but anyway, when Zach found that shed, we thought it could have been this deer. And Greg's playing the footage from that hunt right now. It's a big mature buck walked right past the stand, and Zach's filming it, sitting there telling me to shoot this thing the whole time. And uh, yeah, I didn't ba- shoot it. Bas- basically, what had happened is he just he just had Aaron in his mind had a different vision of what the deer was, and then when it came out, it kind of surprised him, and you know he just made the wrong decision. I but... thought it was a young buck. And I don't know. Ten yards, slightly quartering away. What more do you want? Yeah, <laughs> pretty perfect. So I was kicking myself for that one. But anyway, we thought that was that was the buck's antler mm-hmm. that uh, Zach found today. Turns out it wasn't, but that brought up a good point that we can discuss on tonight's podcast, and that is this hunt. It related to buck bedding. That's how we ended up getting this encounter with this mature buck. And uh, we've got a map pulled up on the screen. I'll kind of walk you through this hunt. You can see the map is pulled up here. We've got the wind direction at the bottom. This is just a blank base map. So I want to kind of talk about our thought process, you know, when we went into that hunt. Mm -hmm. We looked at this map. We knew that this was likely buck bedding around this island of cottonwoods out here. It's essentially an island of cottonwoods in the middle, and then around the outside there's... Yep, young willows, real thick young willows, and in that footage that Greg just played, you can see that buck come right out of those young willows. Yep, that's right. And we'd never hunted this area before, but it's actually really close to a road. Mm-hmm. And this particular public area doesn't get a ton of bow hunting pressure for deer, but it does have a lot of duck hunters that mm-hmm. come in there during the deer season. Go ahead and pull up our our second map. Or okay. here, I can do can that. You get it? Yeah, I can get it here. That's on the edge of how far I can see. <laughs> <laughs> I can get it here. But this will show you kind of uh, what we were dealing with on this hunt. Now I've, I've drawn all of the, you know, illustrations on the map here. Nice duck icon. <laughs> oh, yeah. I found that on, on, yeah. I found that earlier. I figured that would be, you know, real cool for uh, the duck hunters, you know. So this is kind of what was going on. Uh, what day was that? Like the 7th or 5th? Fifth? It was November 5th. Okay, so it's early rut. We're going into this spot to hunt a buck bedding area in the morning. And we are hoping to catch bucks come into the bedding area or move around within the bedding area during the early part of the morning. You know, first few hours was right. the ideal. And, that's, you know. and usually when we're dealing with buck bedding, whether it's a morning hunt or an evening hunt, we're, we're hunting really, really close to it mm-hmm. where we suspect those bucks to be bedding at. Mm-hmm. And in this situation, like we just talked about, we thought that the bucks were bedding in this cottonwood island in the, in the willows that surround it. Now, our access was pretty clean that morning. We came in this little creek. It was a dried up creek bottom, so it was very quiet. We were able to sneak in there Yep. And hardly make no, any noise. And we'd identified on the map that there was a little 
tree. Well, it wasn't little, but what was it, a maple? Yeah, it was a split maple, split like five ways. Yeah, and it was the only big tree, really, mm -hmm. along that creek mm -hmm. leading in. So we took the creek in from the east. There was a, a road that we walked down, and then we popped in the creek in the dark, and we packed the stands down in there and uh, hopped up in that maple tree. If I recall, like, we had a heck of a time. I think we hung up. it once and then pulled it and then hung it again. Like, we got there a good, <laughs> we got to the tree like an hour before daylight, and it was shooting light by the time we were up in the tree. Yeah, yeah. and we, we hadn't seen a deer up to that point. Um, couldn't couldn't see anything, didn't hear anything come in, and it was a calm morning. Very calm mm, and yeah. wet, and kind of wet and warm even, mm -hmm. if I remember right. Yep. Like, it wasn't really cold. No. Yeah. Um, and there was, you know, this area, like we said, gets pressured by tons of duck hunters. So we slid in the back. Actually, not to interrupt you, but I'm, if I'm not mistaken, we heard a deer come in that morning as we were just oh, we finalizing did. setting we up did. the stand. We heard a deer come in and stop in there. Yeah. We did. Mm -hmm. I remember that now. And it was straight up into the into the right, area, right where, right where we expected from, him to yeah. be at. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we get set up and we're sitting there for the first few hours of the morning. And uh, the duck hunters start banging away out here in the marsh, you know, you which hear is pretty yelling, talking and oh, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, they're shooting at ducks and there's, you know, they're all over those marshes. And to the west of this map, there's tons more mm -hmm. of them, you know, so it's not just one set of duck hunters. Right. They're all over it. And I think we sat there in that stand for like three hours, mm -hmm. and we didn't see or hear hardly anything. And then mid-morning, I looked up, and in the middle of that bedding area in that cottonwood island, I saw tines moving. Mm -hmm. And it was just a, it was a buck kind of sliding through there. Mm -hmm. And I looked at Zach, I was like, ah, it's a two-year-old buck that's in that bedding area. You know, he didn't look like he had a great big rack, but I couldn't see anything about his body. I just made that assumption, which was very wrong at the time. Yeah, but... <laughs> well, and another thing I think would be nice, or, you know, a good add to this is when we went in that morning, like we said, it was really calm. As the morning progressed, as do most mornings, the wind starts to ju just gradually pick up. And I would say right about the time it had started to pick up and get a little bit of consistency to it, that's when he got up and made his first move within that bedding area. And that's something that we've seen quite a bit, especially in a very specific pocket, like the one that we've got up here. A buck can go in there and he can bed, and he can bed in the middle of it, for example, and then once the wind starts to shift and he can get a little bit better advantage, he can move and shift within that little bedding area. Something we've seen multiple times, you know, in the past, so... I think that was right about the time we saw that first move was the first, you know, he had been bedded for a couple hours, then he got up, moved, and then, uh, you know, I guess the rest of the hunt panned out. So go ahead, Aaron, take back over. Yeah, he he, uh, he eventually moved, mm -hmm. but that's one reason why I put the duck hunters up on there. Those duck hunters are only two or three hundred yards away from that buck bedding area. We saw him moving around in there, and like Zach said, we sat there all morning, didn't really see much of anything. Mm -hmm. But we're hunting an escape route out of that bedding area. That's what you find. Whenever you, whenever you get into these buck bedding areas and you start identifying the spots where they want to bed, you're, you're gonna find escape routes, um, trails that lead out of the beds towards food sources, towards does, whatever. And we could we could talk for weeks just about how to find a buck bedding area, mm -hmm. but this particular podcast we're just talking about this one hunt, mm -hmm. and that's one thing that we preach a lot is situational tactics. Mm -hmm. Because every, situation every is so hunt, different. every tree stand that you have, no matter what, every property is going to be different. And in this case, you know, we're set up right next to this small buck bedding area. But anyway, the duck hunters are out there in the marsh, and they it was like ten o'clock, and you could hear them start packing up, mm -hmm. banging decoys around, and talking real loud and eventually they they walked out of there mm -hmm. so so basically how how it goes at this point we've got set up as we were getting set up we heard him come in a couple hours go by see him get up and then he disappears again a little bit more time goes by a half hour maybe duck hunters start to pack up and leave right and when the duck hunters left i mean it took them a while to get out of mm -hmm. there but we heard him walking off and get up to the parking lot, start their trucks, and take off out of there. And it was about 30 minutes later. Mm -hmm. And that uh, that buck got up mm -hmm. in that thing. And he came right past the stand. Yep. And that was what was very interesting about the whole hunt, 
was that he was in that bedding area. He went in there before daylight. We <laughs> heard him go in there before daylight on the 5th of November, heavily pressured public land. He goes in there and he's moving around in that tiny little area. I'm mm -hmm. talking, what is it, a half acre inside? Yeah, that's not very big. Um, acre, maybe. Yeah. Maybe an acre. Yeah, and he, he did not leave that bedding area until those duck hunters left. And go ahead and uh, I'll pull up the other map which okay. shows that illustration here. If I can get the thing clicked. I'm sitting about 10 feet away from this computer right now, so... There we go. This kind of shows, this, this particular map kind of shows, you know, what happened when the duck hunters left. They left out of there, and once that buck settled back down, you know, from them leaving, he decided to leave, and he took one of the exit trails leading right past the stand. We had a perfect wind all morning, blowing straight out of the bedding area, right in, in our face. And that's... Uh, really what what saved us mm -hmm. from getting busted all morning long with that buck bedded you know within 60 70 yards of us and really i think that was like the only deer we had no we saw some other deer way off but yeah. that was the only yeah. deer that we had anywhere close to us right yep and that's that's really something that you see often in these buck bedding areas like that is you you won't have a ton of them in there you know yeah. in a lot of in a lot of situations this area is kind of out of the way it's not way it's not really far deep into public mm -hmm. it's what do you say a couple hundred yards from a parking lot yeah it really isn't that far um and you know sometimes you find that though it, especially on an area that's thick like this and doesn't have a lot of tree stand options like aaron said there's a lot of waterfowl pressure in this area but there's not a lot of bow hunting pressure and one of the main reasons is there simply not enough traditional tree stand trees or traditional bow hunting setups in this piece of public? I mean, Brody and I, <coughs> were when we found that shed, we were walking a couple hundred yards or, or I guess probably closer to a quarter of a mile away. And we found so much sign in areas where no matter what you try, you're not getting a tree stand up in a tree. And that's where those bucks are going. That spot is very similar to some of the spots that Brody and I found today. We just got lucky and picked the one tree and we're able to get into it, and it was the right spot. It's yeah, the, right the, sp the bedding that we found today was in sim very similar terrain mm -hmm. with those willows surrounding. You know, that's the thing you can look at with that map is um, all of the, I guess, habitat diversity in this one little area. You know, and that's what really makes it a perfect spot for a buck to bed. They love edge. They love habitat transitions. Mm -hmm. And when you're looking at this, you've got cottonwoods, you've got like this canary type grass or whatever that tall yellow grass is that's mixing into the willows. Mm -hmm. And then you've you, got a different type of grass. You've on got the a different type of grass on the outside. And then right next to that, you've got a creek mm -hmm. that occasionally holds water in it. You know, you and you have all of those habitat features in a small area. That's what really makes it a perfect spot for a buck to bed and live. Mm -hmm. You know, those big mature bucks want to bed in a spot where they have everything. They don't move very far in daylight. Right. Therefore, they have to. I mean, when you think about it, they're like, a big buck doesn't move near as far as does and young bucks do during daylight. So they have to bed in a spot many times where they have access to water, browse, food. Does. And that's yep. another thing about this spot specifically is he did get up. Now... He is escaping that bedding area. He's obviously escaping it in a relaxed manner, though. He's leaving it because he doesn't like the, you know, I guess in our in our theories, he's leaving it because he doesn't like the sound of the humans up on the, you know, towards the parking lot or on the duck ponds, whatever. And the nice thing about with that bedding area is he can get up, he can just move a couple hundred yards in daylight, and then he can be close to some other does, or he can go find a doe. He doesn't have to travel very far. A lot of times, you know, when a buck beds, he's bedding, like Aaron said, with multiple things to his advantage, multiple, you know, things that he needs, food, water, and this time of the year specifically looking for those does. Yeah. And, and that's, and I guess we shouldn't say that he's using that trail simply as an escape route. He's going and he's leaving to go cruise to a, mm -hmm. to a doe bedding area. But what was interesting was he wasn't heading towards where those duck hunters yeah. were. Oh at. yeah, he was. Yeah, he was definitely avoiding that area. There's yeah. no doubt about but that. But it's it's very interesting too. Also, um, on these public areas, people think that deer will will try to go as deep and as far away from from 
basically human presence as mm -hmm. possible. And you'd be surprised, like a couple hundred yards is not, is nothing to a bedded deer. Mm -hmm. In this situation, that buck is, he's in, <laughs> that buck, that buck is in this bedding area with all those duck hunters 200, 250 yards away. Mm -hmm. And he's perfectly content being in there. The wind's actually blowing from the duck hunters mm -hmm. in those sloughs to him. Yep. Which, I mean, that may be another reason why they like to bed there. Yep. You can even see on that on that map that uh, there's a mowed path right along the edge of that slough. And that's what the duck hunters are taking in and out. A lot of the deer hunters that are in there are taking that path in and out. That makes perfect sense for that buck to be bedded in this little thicket off of the side of that about 200 yards away with the wind blowing from that path in there. I mean, he can sense anybody that's coming up that thing. He can smell them. And he can obviously hear him. He was even kind of windy that morning, and you could still hear all those duck hunters up in that slough. But yeah. once they left, he took that travel route out of there and walked right past the stand, and we should have plugged him, but <laughs> yeah. we, didn't, uh, we didn't do it. I don't know if anybody's ever filmed anything before, but you know, it's real stressful when one's coming by, and you're like, that's the one. And the other guy that's got the got all the control is like, that's not the one. Don't put it all on me. You, know? <laughs> I was like, I, you were like, man, you got to shoot him. You got to shoot him. And I said, I don't know. I think he's a young buck, you know, whatever. And Zach had his bow in the tree, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he's 10 know, yards at this point. He was 10 yards. I had, I had got to say this. <laughs> you had your bow in the tree. I was like, well, do you want to shoot him? And, I, and he was right there. He was too close. He, he was just standing there, kind of hanging out. And Zach was like, ah, I don't know. So when he said that, I said, well, dang it. Maybe I shouldn't shoot him. If you would have just said, yeah, I'd love to shoot him, but we don't have time. <laughs> if, you if, you would, if you would have been like, no, I don't have enough time to shoot yeah, him. Yeah, okay, but... maybe I should have said that then. Okay. Uh, well, now we learn, we learn from our mistakes. Well, it's mainly my mistake, but... <laughs> Do we have any questions that we need to address uh, here? People are wondering how you knew that that was buck bedding versus yep. doe bedding, and just kind of explain that a little bit. Okay. Um, I figured we would get into this, and this could take a little while. <laughs> um, buck bedding, uh, as we've kind of alluded to in some of the context clues within this conversation so mm -hmm. far, bucks will bed in an area in which they can survive with their nose. Mm -hmm. So... They'll bed with an obstruction to their back. They'll bed facing an opening. So, uh, I don't know. I guess I guess to put it just in, in simple terms right off the bat, a lot of the times when we're finding a bedding area, like you just said, they have cover at their back and they have a relatively open area in front of them. They either have an Something open area in front of them see. where they're watching their back trail or they can stand up and they can survey everything in mm -hmm. front of them. When you really think about this, mature bucks are solitary animals. They're not like does. Um, usually when does are bedded, they're in groups, and they almost bed in a circular fashion, and does rely much more on their eyes mm -hmm. than they do their nose. They do rely on well, their nose. Well, yeah, it's just they but, have more advantage because they have multiple deer. So they bed in that yes. circle because they can look in every direction. Bucks spend most of their life alone. Mm -hmm. You know, they're in bachelor groups, but when they're in bachelor groups, even they're not care they don't care about the other bucks. Right. They're, they're only worried about number one. So when you think about that, you've got to realize that a mature buck has to survive with his nose. And in order to do that, they go into their bed, they walk into the wind, then they turn around, they lay down, and they face their back trail with the wind hitting them in the back of the head. And when you think about that, it's really genius thing mm -hmm. because they can any predator like a coyote or a cat or anything that's going to get them is going to come up that back trail, smelling their tracks. You know, coming in there, that's how they they catch prey mm -hmm. is following tracks. That buck's watching the back trail. He's got that covered, and what he can't see, he can smell. Right. And if there's, I guess, if there's one thing that like something seriously crazy is going to happen have to happen multiple times for me to change my belief in this bucks will always bed with the wind at their back hands down always end of story like i've never seen one bed when you look in the wrong like i guess wrong way like he's right. always got the wind at his back and and you can find deer beds out there in, in this particular spot it's very easy to find the beds you just go in there this time of year february march when you're shed hunting or whatever and you walk into one of these thickets and you'll eventually 
start finding deer sign and start finding deer beds. Mm -hmm. In a spot like this, it's much easier. Um, but what gives it away that tells you it's a buck bedding area is there'll be buck turds on the ground, there'll be big tracks, big tracks. in and around there, and occasionally you'll find rubs in the beds themselves. Mm -hmm. Or um, rubs leading, one of the things I guess... Rubs more, leading into. Yeah, yes. le leading in and out of the beds, I right. think, is even more um, more of a clue than necessarily in the beds, I guess, because you don't always find them right in the bed. Yeah, you don't. Like today, we found all that buck bedding. I don't even know. Was that like buck brush or what was that Where stuff? was... Um, Where were yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know exactly what... That. No, I don't know what that is exactly. It was a shrub tree that was about six foot tall. It was in the middle of a marsh, similar to willows, kind mm -hmm. of. Um, but it had a lot of that grass growing up in it, and the deer were bedding in there like crazy. There was big buck turds all over mm -hmm. it. But there was not very many rubs. Because there just, wasn't the trees for the rubs. Right, simply. they didn't want to rub on those trees for whatever the reason. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the buck crap in and around that, yeah. that bedding area led us to believe that it was a buck bedding area. Now, another thing to keep in mind that uh, a lot What's of people, <laughs> this is our friend Chomper, he hangs out. <laughs> if he doesn't hang out, he hangs outside and he whines, so he has to come in. Yeah. But a lot of people, they when we say buck bed, they take it the wrong way, that it's 100% only a buck bed's there ever. And it's the Don't same buck. Bed's there. Yeah, you know, and it's... that it's the same buck. Just because it's... We're saying, calling this a buck bedding area. You know, one day it may be the buck that Aaron and I saw. The next, next day, day it may be a, a one-year-old buck. Different buck. Yeah. Greg and I hunted there five days later and saw three does go in there and bed down. Mm -hmm. yep. It's not necessarily a just a buck bedding area, but a doe will bed in a buck bedding area. A buck generally won't bed where a group of does does. No. Not if, if that makes sense. There, there are locations where does will bed that a buck won't, especially a mature buck. And the reason is, is because does bed as a small herd. You know, they bed in a circular fashion, looking in every different direction, and, you know, they're not as dependent on the wind. You know, one doe is going to be bedded with the wind right in her face just so she can look in a specific direction while the other does look the other direction. Yeah, and when you find those beds, you can tell it. You can see them. And... A buck, a buck bed can sometimes be one bed, but many times it's multiple beds mm -hmm. in an area. Yep, definitely. Sorry, does. are we rambling? No, 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 no. Somebody just wonders if uh, Chomper's a shed dog. <laughs> he is. He is anything but a shed dog. <laughs> he hates cold weather and anything other than short grass. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say where we were today. I don't know that he could we get through it. We would have lost him in there. It's Jake. <laughs> oh, <what>? <laughs> <laughs> Jake, <laughs> Cubishman. <laughs> yeah. uh, nice, Jake. You joke. I can't see. Yeah. I can't see the names on mine. Otherwise, I, I would have. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, it, it. in a nutshell, that's what buck bedding is, and we dive into it in much more specific detail on lots of our videos on the YouTube channel and many of our previous podcasts. And stuff we we go into detail about buck bedding and this is just one example yeah, of how we hunted buck bedding and we we basically had success mm -hmm. we should have had yeah. success in I mean, other words yeah we had an encounter so that's a success you got a mature buck at 10 yards that's right. success <laughs> right. well yeah. yeah and you know a lot of our videos too i mean if not all of them are related to you'll hear us mention bedding areas buck bedding areas you know where we think the bucks are bedded whatever it may be and i think just seeing you know the tons of different examples we have on that YouTube channel, you can kind of see, you know, a little bit more of the theory rather than just this one specific spot because every situation is different. Every area that we find a buck bed is a little bit different. There's some general guidelines and some areas like as you do it long enough, you'll be able to walk right to specific spots and have a, you know, pretty good guess at where the buck bed is going to be. But, you know, every situation is different. You kind of just have to keep learning, learning different situations and all start coming full circle after a while. Yep. yep. There's uh, three questions here kind of regarding the same thing. Just wondering why that buck left that bedding area if he was in like, you know, a safe area and then wondering why he went with the wind and just like, why did he leave? I think Zach mentioned it earlier with maybe just hearing those duck hunters, but maybe explain. Who's that from, Brody? Uh, it's from three people here. Tyler Kinley, my brother, and I can't remember the other one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, for one, yes, the duck hunters, him hearing the duck hunters. 
two, he might have been making a wind switch to a certain degree because it did, you know, progressively pick up and wind. And three, honestly, it was November 50th. He's probably going He's to probably check going some dough. Yeah, that dubs, was someone but, else's question, too. Was yeah. it possible he was just kind of doing his thing yes. not looking for dough? Very, very it well. was, but, he, but the interesting thing here with a public area like this that gets a lot of pressure is the timing in which he decided mm -hmm. to get up to go and cruise. It was almost 11 o'clock, mm -hmm. and we had been sitting there for four and a half, five hours. And, and he didn't go with the wind. He didn't even go with a crosswind. He went right with the wind at his back. Yes. Like he was definitely leaving those duck hunters. Like he could have went, he could have went over towards where those those guys were duck hunting because there's definitely does. Well, he came over from there. kind of that direction right. at first light when he went in there right. to bed. But it's you know. It's possible he hits that stuff over by those marshes because mm -hmm. there's deer around there. There's does right. around there. He may cruise through there at night mm -hmm. because that's where human scent is. Right. You know, he's not going to go over there during the daylight. If he does, he's going to get killed. Yep. Um, you know, because of hunters. Yep. Right. But he headed, and the, the interesting thing that you kind of can't see from the map is just to the east of that spot, there's a road a few hundred yards away, and then there's private land across that road. So he was actually leaving the public land going over onto the private land to cruise yep. um, in the middle of the day. And that's, that's another thing when you're hunting public land. Hunt in the middle of the day. Yeah, That's when we see a ton of mature bucks mm -hmm. in the rut is moving in the middle of the day. And that may have a lot to do with it is the absence of pressure during the t uh, 10 to 2 period. And, and you know, a lot of, uh, we get a lot of questions too about why, why did, why get so close or how, how do you get so close without spooking the deer? Well, to be honest, if we'd have been there on time, and now we still pulled it off, obviously. We heard that, what we suspect that deer to, you know, come in, bed down, while we were finally getting the stand set up. But if we'd have been there when we wanted to, you know, set up a half hour earlier, he wouldn't have been back. And a lot of times, especially as you get later into October and November, or even on cold days up in September, when Brody, Jake, and I were hunting in Nebraska, we had one cold morning where deer were not going back to their beds you know within the first hour of daylight mm -hmm. but if you get back in there and you get close if you get in there early enough a lot of times you're beating those deer back from you know where they're feeding to their food source so you know it's it's aggressive but if you you know really uh i guess just use your judgment and get in there early enough at the right times of the year you can obviously have success. You doing can it. beat them back in there, yep. and that's and that's how we've we've killed bucks in the past that got up and meandered around bedding areas oh, a yeah. lot in mid morning. Multiple. You know, we've done that a lot of times. Yep. And then in the evenings, we've you know we've had good luck with them coming out of bedding, heading to you know destination food source or does or, or staging water areas. or staging yep. whatever. What else you got, bro? Uh, did you guys feel there was like any thermal pull towards the water that the duck hunters were using, or were you too far away? We were. Uh, and, we the wind was pretty far. stiff too. Yeah. Like we it was a far. 15 mile an hour wind day, and uh, it's gonna override most of the thermals in there if mm -hmm. you'd have got any pull. And it was several hundred yards from the water, so no, not much going on that day. It was fairly consistent wind blowing straight out of the bedding area, and you know? that creek behind us was even even dry, like we said. So there was no. There was no thermal play with that creek either. It was. It really was perfect way to get in yeah. though. Mm -hmm. Like we slid in there, and and well, that's another thing that we do often, is uh, we set up two stands in the dark, 50 yards from essentially a bedded buck, because mm -hmm. um, he was moving into the bedding area when we were still getting set up, and the only way that we do that is with headlamps. It is just it's just not possible to do in the dark safely without them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've said this over and over again um, on various podcasts and videos and whatnot, but we use these LED headlamps all the time, and we do not believe that it alarms mature bucks. Um, we were up in the tree with those lights going around everywhere, and that thing was moving into the bedding area 60 yards from us. Mm -hmm. And uh, still a few hours later came out and walked right underneath the tree. So... Use headlamps. Use headlamps. That's what we're getting at. <laughs> People are wondering what the food source was for this setup. Uh, that spot, mm -hmm. he's not really close to anything that you would, you know. He's browsing in the marsh yeah. a lot. He's, he was actually browsing on natural native habitat within those cottonwoods at one point. Honestly, that spot's so, you know, far enough from a, a you know, traditional whitetail food source that he's browsing on 
there's tons and tons, thousands and thousands of different plants out there that yeah. he's just browsing his way back. And you'll to that find that area. in these marsh type scenarios, um, deer will just live off natural browse mm -hmm. in natural habitat. Now, there's ag fields to the southwest of him, you know, a quarter mile away. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a few like plots and stuff small, out in there. Yeah, small ones. Um, but... There's acorns to the east of him. Mm -hmm. There's a food plot. You know, over on the neighbors, quarter mile, half mile mm -hmm. away, that I'm sure that he gets to. But a mature buck favors that security of bedding over food in mm -hmm. most situations, especially in a highly pressured area. Now, yep. that not just public land, some properties that some you know there's a lot of people hunting. You know, those the the you may see those and young bucks show up on a food source in daylight, um, but. The mature buck has, you know, he'll just take his time in different stages of, you know, heading to a food source. So, for example, a doe family group gets up an hour before dark and they go, you know, kind of browse around their bed. Then they go to the acorns. Then they go to the destination or, you know, a crop field out into the wide open. Right. Well, a buck may get up a half hour before dark, browse around his bed till 15 minutes before dark, and then get to the acorns. But you cannot think of a mature buck and other deer as the same thing. They're mm -hmm. completely different. Mature buck is going to stand up in that bedding area. He's going to be in a spot, like we mentioned earlier, where he has everything that he needs right there. Yep. It's almost like, you know, he's already went to the store and grabbed all the groceries <laughs> yeah. for the winter yeah, and he's right. went home. He's not going anywhere for he's a while. He's eating in his bed. Yeah, that's what they do. I mean, and that's another thing you find in all these bedding areas. Mm -hmm. When you start finding the buck sign, you start looking around and you see them where they're, they're browsing on this yep. or they're browsing on that. And, uh, yeah, we're not as so much thinking about food as we are about bedding most yep. of the time. People were wondering if, if within that bedding area you found any human pressure. You talked about the duck hunters, but in that little no. area you pointed out. Nobody I'm, goes in there because he, it because doesn't even really look like, like there's, when you look at it from where those duck hunters are at, you're like, yeah, there's just a mound of thick trees right there. Yeah. Like it's, I don't know, half acre, yeah. maybe not even that. Well, I think the thing is about that spot, like I said earlier, there's no, there's like not a lot of traditional setups in there. So like there's not a lot of good trees. We're in basically the only tree that you can even stand. And even, stand even then, I guess honestly, to to most guys, and this is kind of a conversation we've had before, you know, to most guys, it's too aggressive of a sit, so they won't get that close. And if they don't get that close, there's literally nothing else within a half, quarter mile that you can get a tree stand in. I mean. So it just seems truly like there's not a lot of people that go in there other than maybe, you know, rabbit hunters, I guess, maybe pheasant hunters kind of dink around the edge. But like, I don't think there's a lot of whitetail pressure because if you were going to get right in the middle of it where the cottonwoods are big enough, you know, there most people that's too aggressive and, and it may be too aggressive. Yeah. Know? If you get right in the middle of the cottonwoods, you may blow them out of there. It just mm -hmm. depends. Yep. You know, but uh, that's the biggest thing with public land. Get out there and explore and don't, you know, don't just listen to us. Yeah. Like, go out there and learn this right. stuff on your own because everybody has sort of a formula that works in their own situation. Yeah. That's why we preach the situational tactics so often. Yeah. You know, in this particular spot can relate to yours in a lot of ways, potentially, mm -hmm. but uh, your, by your no spot means. might be big timber and oh, yeah. country, you know, maybe completely different. Yep. And, and you know, okay. go ahead, go ahead. Uh, Sorry, just, I, maybe well. we should move on from buck, but <laughs> no. that's, yeah. I was okay. just going to mention, you know, people might have uh, a question about, we were talking about setting up so closely mm -hmm. to a deer, like, um, you know, the equipment that we use, the tree stand equipment, mm -hmm. the, the sticks, the stands and the safety equipment is uh, plays a big part in being oh, yeah. able to set up it does. efficiently and quietly mm -hmm. that close to bedding areas. Definitely. And I was going to mention that um, on our YouTube page we have a video that we did that shows the exact equipment we use and then how we stack it and get it in and then we'll eventually do a, a video here soon that shows exactly how we set the stand, yep. up, the sticks and the stand and and do all that quickly and quietly. Yeah. yeah. That's a big part of being able to hunt close Definitely. to the bedding area. And it yeah. takes practice too. I mean, it's not, you know, I don't know that when we first, well, I know for a fact when we first started, we weren't as efficient as we are now. We still screw up 60% of the time. Sure. <laughs> I mean, but, uh, yeah. it happens a lot. But another thing we use often to get close to, to bedding or to get in the bedding is ghillie suits. Mm -hmm. 
and we just hunt off the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, in this particular area, there's one tree that you can get a stand in, so we chose to get the stand up, you know, mm -hmm. um, and that's what we do most of the time. But in some of these spots, if you're hunting out in a marsh, if you're in Wisconsin, for example, and you're dealing with a big cattail marsh where there's no trees that you could get a stand in, don't be afraid to get out in there and make a setup on the ground. You know, we, we hear that from Jake all the time. He says that, you know, his buddies and stuff, they, they hunt off of like boards out there. Yeah, the they, they'll take boards out in the middle of the swamp, lay it across just so to have, have something, something to stand stuff. on and be 20, 30 yards from a couple of trails that are leading through the cattails just to get closer to bedding. And that's really this, the secret when it comes to hunting public land. When it's mature bucks or any deer for that matter, mm -hmm. if you want to have success, you've got to find where the deer are living at during the day. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's the, the best way to put it is don't hunt the deer where you think they may be. Hunt the deer where they are. And it seems silly when you, think of, when you say it like that, but since we've started doing it, it's like that... There's no other way to do it because you can guess a food source wrong. You can guess, you can guess a bedding area wrong, but if you find really, really, really good bedding areas, then there'll be a deer in there. There'll be some sort of deer in yeah. there almost every day. Yeah, it's just interesting to try something different too. If you're hunting only food sources, maybe look at trying this out. Yeah. Probably have some fun. What else we got? We got Gentlemen? questions regarding all kinds of mm -hmm. different stuff. Let's go, let's go through them. Let's yeah. get to them. Okay. Uh, let's see. Will you continue to show? Will you continue the show throughout the turkey season? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> we've got uh, we the hunting be, public we be showing during yeah. the turkey season. We got the, <laughs> we got the turkey tour coming up. Uh, I believe we're going to start around the middle of March. We're going to go down south and hunt public land in Alabama first, and we're probably just going to get our butts kicked for a week and a half or so. And why is that? Uh, because it's early season turkey hunting. It's turkey hunting in the south. Everybody down there is just nuts over turkeys and That makes it really tough. The public land has lots of hunting pressure. The birds are scattered throughout and uh, The terrain is is difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, you're in early in the season like that You're dealing with very hinned up turkeys yep. that, that only gobble a few times on the roost in the morning And then when they fly down, they don't say a peep all day so you really got to go in and rely on scouting and woodsmanship and patience to set up and kill those birds. We, were, we hunted public land in Mississippi last year, and what did we do? We were there for like nine days, ten days? Eleven. Yeah. I think we were eleven, and we killed on ten and... Or killed on day eight, day, day nine, and day... And we should have killed on day eleven. We nine and ten should have killed on eleven. But yeah, yeah it took that's us... That's how long it took. Yeah, yeah, it took us a long time. It took us well over a week to really find the, the birds, and we're hunting a huge public area. Yep. And we're going to start in Alabama. We may bounce around to Mississippi or Georgia, but I'm not getting my hopes up. Like, mm -hmm. it may take us two weeks in Alabama to kill one on public land, mm -hmm. but we're going we're gonna to have that turkey tour start in the middle of March on the Hunting Public YouTube channel, and we'll be bringing you daily updates throughout that. Uh, we try to get those out as as soon as possible after the hunt occurs. Mm -hmm. Like, we'll be editing in camp and then driving to town and grabbing Wi-Fi at a Starbucks or something to try to get these videos up for you as soon after they happen as possible. So that, that turkey tour will continue on from there. We're going to end up hunting public land in Oklahoma. Probably go to Kansas and hang out with the with our friends down there, and then hunt public land in Missouri, Iowa, potentially Wisconsin, Nebraska, and Ohio. Uh, yeah, we were just we're gonna continue. That's that's what we've done for the last several years too. We kind of go down south, start on public land down there, and then work our way north. Uh, all the way through April and May and, and just bounce from state to state. And so. if you want to keep up with these updates, they're, they're, I, we think they're really fun. You know, if you go over to the YouTube page and subscribe, you'll get every update that we give. I mean, yep. it's, it's really, it is daily and it, you know, is a fun little story to follow along with, I think. Okay. What is the exact name of the tree that is used for the horizontal rubs? Scotch pine. Scotch pine. Head Miller special. <laughs> <laughs> His, his, uh, the scotch pine tree looked exactly like I thought it would when we, when we saw it. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty hilarious. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's not like Ted has a lot of these scotch yeah, pines. Yeah, he has one. like a couple in yeah, his front two, yard. Two, I think. And yeah. the whole thing is just bare 
yeah. like for 30 feet that where he's been going funny. up and cutting Cut limbs for off. the last 10 years. He's got to keep <laughs> climbing higher and higher every year. Yeah. What was the name of that late season plant that you killed your buck over? Um, arrowhead plant or duck potato. Dan Enfalt's actually planted that in some of his marshy stuff up in Wisconsin. Um, and I know that he had a lot of deer eating it at one time. You plant it, you know, along the banks of a, of a marsh or whatever, but this, it's a wild plant, mm -hmm. you know, and it was growing wild in that particular hunt, you know, out in those river bottoms. And that was very interesting too, because that plant was still green all the way into January, late season. And Probably they were eating it. Green. They ate it in July. Mm -hmm. We saw them out there eating it First all time we year. saw deer eating on it. There was a there was a mixture of that and then smart weed that they were feeding on, and we watched just deer pile into a, a bottom like that, into a river bottom like that, and we we're like, well, what, what's going on, you know? Yeah. So we kept tabs on it, and then Brody and I went back and checked it the first time, and would have been first week of December, I believe. Mm -hmm. It's been a couple. Months. And we saw like twenty deer out there, and we're like still on game on and, and basically from there until the end of the season they, here we're they feeding. chewed it down to where it was just stalks the mm -hmm. stalks were still green yeah the, the leafy part of the plant had kind of wilted yeah and you every now and then you'd see deer that would pick up that leafy mm -hmm. kind of brown it looked like an old turnip chompers yeah. over there growling yeah <laughs> that that kind of goes back to what we were talking about food sources a minute ago though um that's a food source that a lot of people don't think about but that's natural browse <laughs> For those deer in that river bottom and those deer were betting about they were betting yards right next to stuff. it and they were walking past standing soybeans to mm -hmm. eat it during mm -hmm. late season so that just goes to show you the power of natural food sources and a secure food source a food yes. source where in, within the bedding area yes. almost yep um best time to do like after season scouting to get an accurate representation of a new area best time to do of it pretty much from now from the time the season ends until the season starts i know that's really broad but you know there's different things you can learn at different times of the year you know as long as you go out there and you do it you don't want to do it every day you want to go through in different you know maybe in the winter once you know right about now once you know after maybe your turkey season or whatever is all over and then one more time you know in the late part of the summer a couple of months before your season starts but when you go in there and do it, a lot of times when we go and scout something, we make one big path, and then we leave it alone until we come back the next time. So, you know, ideally... And we don't scout the same area. Like, we'll go in and, and scout, say you'll take a property. You'll go in and scout it this time of year, and then like you said, maybe again in the summer, mm -hmm. but we'll scout it differently. Yep. We'll look, look at different spots. We'll look at access routes that we might have missed on the first time in or whatever. But many times on these public areas... Like the spot we went to today, we were looking at that one bedding area and thinking, okay, where do we set up? We found that cedar tree out there. We're mm -hmm. like, okay, right here we can access. We can hunt this spot at this time next mm -hmm. fall for this wind. We did all the scouting and all the prep today. Mm -hmm. And we won't go back into that until October yeah. during deer season next year. So basically you're figuring out everything in one trip and then you're going in there. That's why we dive dive into bedding this time of year and even into the summer. And if you got buddies to help you scout, do it because you can cover a lot more ground with multiple people. I mean, there's lots of times where it's like, hey, you guys got to come look at this. And, and you know, the other guys would have walked right past it. Mm -hmm. just, just not because they don't know where to go. It's just you miss little things. And, you know, and you know this time of year is a good time of year to be out scouting mm -hmm. a new property because it's all the foliage is gone. Yeah, you can see further you than can any see other further. time of you year. Can, And when you're scouting a new property, you're not only looking for deer sign, you're looking for people sign, you're looking for fences, you're looking for creeks that you can't cross, you know, ditches that the deer may not be able to cross, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, it never ends, the scouting. <laughs> it's a year-round thing. Um, what would you guys do to stop a buck that is chasing a doe? Hey! <laughs> <laughs> probably. Anything you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, probably start with some soft whistles and then turn to, hey! Uh, it's, I mean, we've, we've also had where one was just walking just this past fall one was just walking past you and you tried to give it the soft bleat and it gone so. yeah he was gone like he'd heard that before yeah. he'd heard that, that before for sure it's eh, 
yeah, anything you can without spooking them, I guess. It's generally, I would say all of us just kind of give it a bit. It, yeah. I'll give a quick reminder for anybody that's joined us here as we've been going along. Um, please comment and ask us questions during this podcast because Legendary Whitetails is going to be giving away 10 of these hoodies at the end of the show here in 20 minutes or whatever. Mm -hmm. So uh, whoever has the best comments and questions in the podcast is going to be getting, you know, potentially a free hoodie. Yeah. So uh, ask us questions if you have any. Yeah, we did get one good comment. Somebody suggested you needed to move about six inches to the left or right because it pretty Me? much it pretty much looks like you have antlers on your head when you're <laughs> it does. sitting back there. That's Me? So, yep, right there. Right there. Right there. Boom. I like it. That's sweet. <laughs> well, it's hard to get the spacing right, you know, where they yeah. get tucked in right here. But, uh, yeah. It's good. good in there. At what age did you guys realize you wanted to be in the hunting or outdoor industry? Oh, I took six, a different road. I was I 16, went to school for say. wildlife um, biology and research, and I had started down that road. And then at 24, 25 is when I started. Yeah. I, uh, me and my cousin Brandon, we used to watch Monster Bucks videos when we were real young. Like, just started getting into hunting, you know. My uncles all had... Uh, what's that old video where they're bow hunting on the ground and like shooting them running? Gene and, Wenzel, the yeah. October White Tail. That's it. Gene and Barry Wenzel. My yep. dad loves this. Classic. We, loves them. Yeah, yeah. We watched that over and over and over again when we were kids. And uh, as we started watching, you know, Monster Bucks, we're like, we should go out there and film our hunts. So we got a little handy cam. Mm -hmm. and I guess it started at an early age for me, yeah. anyway. Six, I could talk I think I was 16 it. when me and my buddies, me and a group from high school and my brother, we just were like, hey, let's do it. And we just started filming everything we did. Rabbit hunting, squirrel hunting, yep. deer hunting, turkey hunting, whatever. I mean, we were ground, actually groundhogs what started it all. Popping groundhogs. That's yeah, what, that's fun. The first few things we filmed. Hey, oh, it's the most fun. <laughs> Got another one, Brody? Yeah. How often will a buck use the same bed? Oh, pretty often. And it, um, depending and it on the situation, in, it varies on a lot of different factors: food sources, hunting pressure, does you know, time of the year. It, it's it's that's a it's a very very that's a question that we could spend long time hours on. on. I and I would say it's more they're more prone to using the same bedding area multiple times than they are the same bed, yes. but they will use the same bed mm -hmm. also. Yep. Um, buck nest a few years ago, mm -hmm. we went in there, we watched them stand up out of this bed literally a deer bed in front of this willow tree big buck stood up out of it went back the next night another different big buck stood up out of the same bed me and Corey went back a week week and a half later mm -hmm. two big bucks stood up yep. right there yep out of that very same bed and so that was there was three different ended up being three different mature bucks using that bed in early october now that's a special situation, you know, that's definitely not the norm, but it, it is possible to find those primary bedding areas like that. And then Sean and I hunted that same same exact area on November 22nd, didn't see a single deer bedded out there. They were close and they were traveling through there, but they weren't bedded there. Right. How yep. do you guys we, feel? Well, how do you guys on. feel about bucks using cedar thickets to bed? They do it. And they, they the, the, one of the things, there's two, there's two factors that come to my mind when thinking about a cedar bedding area and I guess how my vision of a cedar bedding area has changed over the last couple of years. There's two, two ways that they use it. One is get right in the darn center of that thing to where they're going to be able to hear anything. It's just too thick that they're, you know, maybe even more so than their um, sight. Or, or, you know, really some situations or some, some direction from that bed, um, you know, just simply hearing a predator come to them is, is, you know, one of the ways they use it. And another thing is they're going to bed on the edge of that cedar thicket a lot because they can bed on the edge, they can see out of it, and then if they need to get out of there, they've got like the best cover ever to Remember just Remember that, that cedar thicket there where uh, we killed the doe on the wind bump where you were hunting mm -hmm. their late season? When we walked to the end of that, how big is that cedar thicket, for example? That's mm -hmm. probably five, six acres. Mm -hmm. It's big. But 
we walked around the edge of that cedar thicket and there's tons of sign around the edge of it like zach mm -hmm. saying beds rubs scrapes trails but it's so thick in there mm -hmm. like once you go 20 yards in if you can even get that far there's nothing in there mm -hmm. there's no deer sign yep and it's just i think you even see that on properties that are quote unquote over managed mm -hmm. with like timber stand improvement or ones that that aren't maintained timber stand mm -hmm. improvement you end up getting thick cover but it's too thick for the deer to walk through they they want it thick but they want to be able to escape yes. and they they want to bed in a spot where they can stand up and they can survey stuff they can see stuff in the middle of one of those thickets they can't right looks like we got a bunch of questions coming in uh might want to do like a lightning, Brett, lightning round. <laughs> Brett Favre or Peyton Manning? Sorry, Wisconsin. Peyton Manning. Brett Favre. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a specific decoy, a group of decoys you guys like to use in the spring? Oh, I don't know. on. I mean, it's yeah, situational. Situational. Yeah, situational. And we'll get into that on, the, on you, a lot of our meaning, videos. If you're meaning brands, we've used just about every one of them, and they all work. I wouldn't say any one <laughs> works better than the other. We've had luck using single hand decoys. We've had luck using strutting decoys. tom decoys, um, half strut jakes, and we use them all at different times of the year and in different scenarios. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they all have their place. We'll cover that in depth throughout the spring. Yep. I mean, there'll, be, there'll be a lot to learn there on as far as decoy choice. There's a designer from Legendary wondering uh, what's your guys' favorite apparel to wear from Legendary. I was just, oh, I just that's said, a good question. I just said, well, okay, Flannel. I've got two, I've got two things. This, this, <laughs> I just said today that I'm wear this so much on videos, I'm going to like end up looking like a cartoon character, like that just wears the same clothes like, every, in every episode. <laughs> like on South Park? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. You're just going to be like, oh, that's that guy that wears that green shirt. So I like that. And then I've also got that really sweet deer shirt. Oh yeah, oh, dude. Yeah. That oh, deer man, shirt. I wish we had a awesome. picture of that. Oh, wait. I can probably yeah. Let's see get if we get it on your phone. That deer shirt's <laughs> awesome. I like the uh, the hunt guard, the cold weather gear that we use. Yeah, yeah. That kept us warm in brutal conditions. Yeah. This this winter, it was really season. sweet. It was like some of the best you know cold weather clothing that I've ever worn. Yeah. And I would probably agree with Zach on the flannels. Like that worked I have right. a couple of those. Yep. <laughs> yeah. There's Zach's shirt. Can you see it? Closer. <laughs> There you go. That's it. Get a good look. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty great. That's, that's that hat's all right, too. <laughs> yeah. That's, so basically, that's got some, some nice bucks on it. And it's a really it's beautiful some, yellow it's color. It's got some legendary whitetails on mm -hmm. it, man. You can tuck it in. You can tuck it in. Sometimes Brody lets you borrow his belt buckle. It looks really good. He was so proud of that shirt when he got it. All, all kinds of Snapchats, like just different models. It, yeah. it was awesome. Well, I, I got tons of last. pictures. How do you guys transport your deer without a truck? <laughs> oh, you'd be uh, astonished and surprised, but it works with a car. It does work with a car, and and we do have a couple of trucks. So yeah, in most cases, when we kill one, we call somebody with a truck, or yeah, we borrow, which is usually Greg or Brody. Or Brody. Or Brody. <laughs> um, but we have hauled them out on the trunk of the Smurf mm -hmm. a couple of times. I put one time in college. I put. And this is actually a roadkill deer that I got a salvage tag for, but I threw it right in the trunk, and there was yeah. deer fur in my trunk for years. I killed some does and put them in the trunk, but if you kill a buck, it doesn't, it doesn't fit. fit. <laughs> like you got to put it on top of the mm -hmm. trunk and then strap the ratchets through the back windows. We but did, it works. We did check stations uh, on deer hunts when we were in college, mm -hmm. and you'd see all kinds of vehicles, uh, cars. They'd put them on top in the trunk, in the back seat with a tarp, like just yeah, everything you can imagine. Yes. Do you have a favorite buck call? Do you have a favorite buck call? Yeah. Oh, I don't I like know. To throw the, I like to throw them the snort wizard. The snort wizard. <laughs> I wonder if they're talking about brand or... Uh, we use a variety of uh, deer calls or we there's have actually, in the past, you know. Watch. But there's a... Oh, yeah. There we go. There's, a, there's couple. a couple of them right there. We've used both of these the last year this is a woodhaven that aaron's yep. got and this is a primos so this one sounds very realistic yeah that one that one can get really loud but this one yeah and then the, the snort wizard of course 
Colton, Colton, our friend Colton really can get into the, the snort, snort wheezing. What else you got? Uh, what's your favorite buck or decoy setup? Buck. Buck decoy setup? Yeah. Or, or deer decoy setup, I guess, probably. What is your favorite buck or doe decoy setup? Mm -hmm. So I, I used doe decoys at times or simply took the antlers off of the, the buck decoy that I had and didn't have very good resu results with that. So I, after that, I just strictly buck decoy. Buck decoy. Yep. We're coming up on an hour, so we've got time for another handful of questions. Let's see if we yeah, can speed, rattle off the speed, speed round rounds. here, Good. and then we'll choose the winners. When entering a new piece of public, what's the first feature you look for to scout? Oh, uh, probably uh, ease of access. As we look far at, as yeah, we look at access, and we I would say we also look at multiple habitat features that yes. come together. Habitat diversity and, and human access. The yeah. less human access, the more habitat diversity, the better the area. Yep. What do you guys do to reduce scent? <laughs> Nothing. Uh, very little. Greg's cat was laying on top of our camo <laughs> clothes over here a while ago. We just don't have time to, to mess with it, really. I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that I'm very not scent controlled. Boring we pay energy. attention to the wind. We focus solely on the wind and how to read thermals and wind currents in every situation to uh, hunt them to our advantage. Yep. That's our scent control. Do you guys have any fun traditions related to a successful trip out? Oh, probably a lot of them that we don't even think about. Say that again. I, any I kinda, kinda any fun that traditions together. that we have from probably a successful after, like, trip? A, yeah, after a successful trip. Oh, what are, like what are some of the things that we do at, yeah. after the end? Or or even just we drive around town. Yeah, we drive around town. Are, are you cream, kidding me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it started this year. Brody and I drive around town. We yell at everybody and say, hey, we're ta Brody's tagged out. <laughs> That's our new thing. Hey, <laughs> then they look at it. It's really weird. Because but, but there's not a whole lot of things to do around here, so you got to make your own fun, and that's one of the things. There's usually things that food make. involved after yeah. a successful hunt. Usually a Subway or Casey's <laughs> yeah. run, because we're just, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Hungry and tired after dragging deer out, so. Yeah. We call it the Tagged Out Tour. Be, be, please create your own Tagged Out Tour. I hope to run into you someday yelling at me saying you're Tagged Out. That'd be yeah, awesome. Yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> make my day. May, yes, indeed. Make my week, life. <laughs> what else you got? How soon will Buck return to his bedding area after he gets, like, bumped out? Oh, could be immediately, depending on the nature of how you spook them. If, you, if they smell you, they see you, the whole shebang, and you see them run for, like, two miles, <laughs> probably not coming right back in there. But if you, if you lightly bump them out of there, and if they don't know what you were, if, for instance, you spook a buck, he runs off, stops, turns around, and blows, and stands there and stomps and looks back in your direction, he probably doesn't know what spooked him. Mm -hmm. And the odds of him coming back are pretty high. Yep. So hunt that area immediately or the very next time that you have similar conditions. Now, we're this is something that we are always talking about. If you keep following along with us, you'll be able to, you know, learn more about that. We'll dive into that way more in depth in other podcasts, other videos and stuff. So um, it's just one of those things that, you know, we're, we're always trying to learn more about when is the right time to go back, but we're always discussing it. Yeah, here I'm going to uh, flip it over to our YouTube uh, channel really quick. And uh, for those that are interested in that uh, that kind of question, there's a series of hunts here three days in a row that Aaron and Zach had in Missouri mm -hmm. where they spooked a big buck. I think you can maybe see it uh, you can see on that it one right the, there. Yep. That, yep. Okay. Yeah. So anyways, that's there's some really good information in that series of hunts there about Spooking a buck and then coming back and hunting back. him immediately yep. in the in so. the bedding area. And I believe our second to last podcast, which you can find on the YouTube channel as well, we go way in depth about that in that podcast as well. Yep. Do you guys put much stake into spots where you see an old permanent stand? It's, yeah, kind yeah. of, you know, like so. There's been a fair amount of spots that we've went to, and we, you know, we pick the spot and we get up there. One of the an old funny, wizard of the old woods. Wizard, that man, it's so funny, <laughs> but yeah. It's, there's definitely something to it, especially, yeah. I'm guessing Eric commented here, if you don't come to Wisconsin, we can't be friends anymore. Okay. Wisconsin wants to know if you boys want to spear a sturgeon. Jeez. Uh, no, Jake just we should have done spear yeah, a sturgeon. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I do want to spear a sturgeon. Okay, we got a few pictures here of Jake sturgeon Jake. spearing. Yeah, this is 
the that's, moment the moment of truth right here the spur, the sturgeon swimming into his uh into the view there is that they're trying it, pulling to... pulling it out I'm, I'm assuming at that point and then there's the, the crew that's, the crew that's a big fish <laughs> the sturgeon yeah he's making the video on it now hopefully yeah, we we'll have, have that soon yep how much did that weigh jake <laughs> that <laughs> thing was huge did, did you know how much it weighed no i don't 69 pounds seriously holy mm -hmm. cow Ooh. that's 69 Un inches 69 pounds unreal that's wild what else we got for questions? We got a couple yeah. more minutes here, and then we got to wrap up. How do you up. guys feel about deer drives? Uh, yeah, I don't love them. Whatever, whatever you want to do, get Did wild out there. Big buck to you guys, yeah. you and Jake. Deer drives are awesome. Ball. Yeah, yeah I mean, you're not a part of them. <laughs> yeah, if you know where the bedding is, you can either drive it out and shoot deer out of it, or you can set up in a surrounding bedding area when somebody yes. else is and driving it out routes. and use escape routes like what we were discussing earlier to your we have advantage on on youtube i don't remember which day it is uh greg scroll oh. up if you don't mind we're all get, we're game for getting people in the woods yeah so uh if that means getting out there be... with your buddies and doing deer drives then get wild go do it what else you got bro did Brody Everybody ever ate. get that girl's number at the drive-thru? <laughs> Sadly, no. Well, we know, we know she Brody didn't works, even tell so. us. Brody didn't even tell us it was his birthday today, <laughs> let alone was he going to ask some girl at McDonald's for, for a number. <laughs> Jeez. Nice. Couple more. You guys going to be at the Iowa Deer Classic? Uh, I'll probably be there walking around at some point at the very least. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to be there walking around yeah. as well. Uh, we won't have so a booth, so. so if you, no, if you yeah. see us at the at the Iowa Deer Classic, just come over and. There's a real talking. good chance though that we'll be up at uh, Deer Fest. Yeah, in um, Wisconsin. Yeah, cool. Come up to Wisconsin this spring and summer. We'll get you on some thirty pound carp with a bow. Sounds I'm down good. for some carp and turkey I bow, action. I have a bow fishing rig that needs to be put to use. That'd be <laughs> pretty sweet. Help me find some smallmouth rivers too. <laughs> what? Next. Oh, uh, that's all I got. Okay. Greg, you got any more we need to address here? Um, somebody was asking if I got to hunt my private land spot this year, uh, maybe one time in early October, but then I found out that it had basically been overrun by cattle. Mm -hmm. I was hunting a big deer in there the previous year, and I'd seen it a couple times and was feeling like I might have a chance at it, but the cattle pretty much inundated that whole block of timber where that deer had been bedding mm -hmm. and uh, moving through the year before. And I think somebody killed that deer. They did on a adjacent property somewhere so really? giant buck that. yeah they yeah. killed him this year yep cool. yep he I, moved out of there probably I, because of the cows probably but. because of the cows yep i never got a i got one picture of him in summer um and then yeah. after that spent he, the year hunting public spent, land spent the year hunting public land which is all good <laughs> yep uh one last question here it's probably pretty good mitch huffman he wants to know for each of you guys what is your number one tip to live by for whitetail hunting ah good question be mitch. aggressive that's mine. Greg? Hmm. Number one tip to live by. Have fun. Yes. It's easy to yeah, get caught up in inches of antler age and you forget to have fun. I mean, at some point, some people graduate to, you know, they want to move beyond uh, maybe hunting younger deer and want to have a, a better or a, a greater challenge, you know, mm -hmm. hunting certain age class deer. But it's, it's easy to kind of lose track of why we hunt in the first place and that's one thing that we've really found in the past few years is hunting with friend, family and friends and hunting as a group on public land i've had more fun in these past few years than i've had in a long time mm -hmm. you know hunting with these guys so keep it fun i would probably just associate myself with that same answer similar answer anyway my belief is that don't turn deer hunting into a competition amongst people mm -hmm. um that's the biggest thing it deer hunting is everybody's mm -hmm. like you can create whatever you want out of it right you can you can decide if you want to go to the woods and you get enjoyment out of shooting a fork horn you can do that mm -hmm. if you want to go to the woods and shoot does you can do that if you want to try to learn about mature bucks and hunt them you can do that and even though we're talking about mature bucks on this podcast we don't necessarily just shoot mature bucks i mean we're kind of opportunistic hunters and we will take a buck that's maybe not five years old or whatever we we don't <laughs> maybe not most, yeah, most of them we shoot aren't that you know we like to learn about those deer but keep realistic expectations yes. would yes. be the best tip. okay mm -hmm. yeah um keeping while keeping realistic expectations be aggressive get after them yeah bro. have fun <laughs> and keep it. realistic expectations every yes. year take a kid hunting 
Yes. Amen to that. Yep, that's right. Looks like I'm playing Xbox Live. I'm sure it does, but I'm trying to be productive here and uh, switch, switch back and forth. <laughs> All right. Screens. Just so, so nonchalant. I'm just like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm I have Xbox got over here. the winners of the giveaway from we go. tonight's podcast. There are 10 of them Cody Brumel, Gregory Hamper, David Riley Jr., Stacey Hicks, Christy Jordan, Tom Brayan. Scott Wilson, Patrick Ryan, Kayla Lynn, and Brody Backen. That is the 10 winners for tonight's giveaway. Awesome. Congrats. Uh, is that it, boys? We need to address anything else before we uh, wrap up? I don't think there's anything else I had. Okay. Nope. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. And uh, be sure, like we said earlier, to subscribe to the Hunting Public YouTube channel. And stay tuned here at Legendary Whitetails. This spring, we're going to be uh, creating some cool content with those guys as well. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.